Welcome to the Rocking Life podcast, Rocking Life After Divorce. And today we have a guest whose name is Katie Davy, and she's going to share a little bit more about co-parenting. And we're going to talk about co-parenting and how to do it the best possible way when you have a difficulty communicating with your former spouse. And uh, here is a short clip from the interview. I think my idea might be a little bit different than some. I think that I have learned that you can't change someone else. So sometimes you have to change your own behavior and it sucks sometimes that you have to do that. But, you know, if I can anticipate what my co-parent is going to do, then I have the ability to change my reaction and it doesn't feel fair all the time. But but yeah, being being proactive instead of reactive, I think is a really good way to look at it. And that's been most helpful to me, just knowing I'm not going to be able to change their behavior, but I can change mine. I just wanted to share a few very exciting things that are coming up. One thing is that I have been invited to the Divorce Summit that actually starts tomorrow. And I will be speaking on Thursday, November 19th at 4 p.m. And... uh, I'm one out of 22 speakers and I will be speaking on how to gain awesome friends. You all know if you've listened to the podcast that I have connecting as one of my absolute passions to share and and speak on and help people how to connect deeply with other people. Mainly because I went through extreme loneliness going through the divorce and I did not have a lot of close friends like I could be open with vulnerable and and share with so I will be speaking on that as a subject and I will also share more about a training that is coming up that I will be training from uh, you know starting on December 1st uh, we will have a training for six weeks and it's on the book everyone communicates few connect from John Maxwell who is the master at connecting is an uh, amazing speaker but also connector how you connect with people and the book is about how do you get the necessary how do you acquire the necessary skills how to connect because connecting is a, a skill it's not something you're born with so you have to practice them and, and learn how to connect with people and there's nothing better than having awesome friends and uh, you might have heard the first podcast when I share my friend with my friend Lloyd and we talk about how we became fr- good friends. And uh, this training is all about how you go from loneliness to having awesome friends and being deeply connected, meaning that, that you're developing and you become good friends with a few people that you can share anything with, you can talk to and, and, and have fun. So that's a little bit about what's coming up and uh, it's limited to 12 spots so uh, it will be more information in the description below. Uh, you can send me an instant message and you can enroll on, on there. But uh, let me know and here comes the interview. Have fun. Today we have Katie here today. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing real well. And... Uh, I just want to share a little bit about uh, the podcast here initially. And we're going to have a little chat with Katie about uh, collaborative co-parenting. I think it's so important to, uh, to bring awareness around it and how important it is. And uh, do, do you have your coffee ready today? or I do. I have it. I got it earlier. Yeah. Do you have yours? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Good. <laughs> yeah. And, and this podcast, it came out of a, my, my, myself. I went through a divorce uh, Five years ago, and uh, I've shared that on previous podcasts, and just have a passion to help people. I'm, I'm a business professional, uh, so I do this uh, on the side, but I, I really want to help people that go through divorce, bring awareness, bring uh, hope. Uh, there are a lot of people that are I've met throughout both prior to the podcast, but in the podcast so, that are, after many years, have not been able to get through, and I, I know this this can be very, very difficult. But I can also see that this can also be 
uh, an opportunity to turn this divorce into an opportunity to make your life an amazing life after this. Absolutely. And have, it, have it like a, a catalyst, a kick in the butt or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. Yeah. Uh, to, I think that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. I think it can be a, a really, for me, it was initially, it was very, very difficult, but uh, I think it can be, if you turn it into something uh, where you actually look at the positive side of it, it can actually be your, your turning point in your life. And mm -hmm. um, that's why I want this podcast to be, to be a, a place of hope where people can find the hope, can see the, the potential, uh, can see other people that have actually been through it and gone through it in a successful way. Yeah, and, uh, I love that. Yeah, I think that's, that's important. And uh, you, uh, a little introduction to you, Katie, and I'm going to ask you to share a little bit too, but uh, you're divorced since a few years and uh, uh, you're a mom of two young, young kids and uh, mm -hmm. you've developed a strong passion for intentional co-parenting. I like that word, intentional. Yeah, and, uh, I think that's important. Yeah, it needs to be intentional. And uh, yeah. after you and your your husband separated, and um, you are also also very uh, familiar with the many struggles that co-parents have and uh, that the children face, and mm -hmm. uh, that you also hope in the future to be able to help families in transition and uh, through these difficult stages. And um, you're also studying psychology, right? I am. Yeah, I just graduated with my bachelor's in psychology. So the next step is to get a master's in uh, marriage and family therapy so that I can hopefully turn this all into some sort of collaborative co-parenting effort for the community so we can all work together to bring kids and their families closer with less of the high conflict extra stuff so they can just be together, enjoy their time together like they should. Yeah. Divorced, so, separated, whatever. So wh where did this passion come from? I th so I think that I've always had some interest in psychology, but once I got divorced and I realized, you know, the court system doesn't really help as much as one would like with yeah. um, co-parenting and they kind of give you like that one 30 minute class and then you're supposed to just figure out how to do it from there. So I felt like going through that process and trying to kind of figure out how to co-parent on my own with someone that I couldn't get along with, it really gave me a drive to figure out how can we help other people? How can we help kids? How can we help families reduce the stress, reduce the, you know, the, the mental aspect of it and just really enjoy each other? Because that's what, you know, getting divorced is about, right? You want to enjoy your life. You want to start something fresh and new. So your kids should be able to do the same, I think. Yeah, and uh, where the kids can actually feel secure and um, to not have a bunch of strife. Exactly. Yeah, I, I interviewed Mark here a few episodes ago, and uh, he talked a lot about uh, collaborative divorce, and you're sharing about collaborative co-parenting, and I like that word, to work together mm -hmm. To, uh, to, but it's not always easy and you have to have two parties no. that can actually work together and sometimes you need to have external help to, to facilitate that and help, help out when there is a lot of friction, a lot of fear and um, mm -hmm. a lot of changes. So it's, uh, how do you do that? Do you, do you have experience and do you know how to do that? So I think the most important thing that I've learned during my co-parenting experience and just watching, you know, I've got a few friends who are part of blended families. And I think the most important part of it is to try to remove the emotion, but that's so hard. Yeah. If you can, if you can just like forget how much you don't like each other, it becomes so much easier for everyone to parent because really it's about the kids. Yeah. But when you have all of these emotions running around, it's, it's way more difficult. I'm sure you yeah. know this. Many of us know this. But that's so hard to do, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I don't know. I think men probably has a harder time dealing with this because you're not really used to having to deal with these intense emotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you go through a, a divorce with a lot of fear, a lot of strife, 
and having to start dealing with that. I don't know if it's true or not, if men have a harder time or, but um, my experience when I've talked to people, it seems to be a little more difficult. Um, But, uh, and then to be able to find a way to work together. So Mm -hmm. what what would your ideal approach to uh, to the word collaborative co-parenting look like? I think that it would be, Essentially, you would have parents who could come together in with their new partners, with extended family, with, you know, friends. Like, it takes a village, right, to raise kids. Yeah. So, everybody just needs to work together for the common good of the kids. But like we said, that's so difficult to do. Um, and I think that a lot of times people forget about the extended family and how important they are, too. And then... I also feel like, of course, you have to set boundaries and of course you have to make sure that your new significant other or the step parent isn't overstepping, but they also have to be a part of it because they're taking care of the kids, living with the kids, whatever the case may be. So I really feel like there there has to be an effort on every single person's part to work together. But that's so difficult because then sometimes you have, you know, four people trying to work together and that can be crazy sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I like that idea that takes a village to raise the kids and, uh, and yeah. also bringing in extended family into this process. I don't think that's mm-hmm. a bad idea at all. I think uh, I haven't thought about that, but that is probably if you have people that can communicate and collaborate, uh, uh, collaborate, collaborative, how would you say that? (laughs) Collaborate. Collaborate uh, (laughs) together. That's not always easy, but if you're on speaking terms, uh, I think that's very good. Or to have a coach. Mark shared about having, you know, each parent have a coach where you're actually working together. I think that's a great idea. Mm Mm-hmm. So. Uh, it's almost sort of like like mediation then, you know, yeah. you can kind of work together with your coach and then your coaches maybe can work together or whatever the case may be. That's because a great idea. In the collaborative divorce, you actually have, usually have one coach each and then you're working together. This is especially mm-hmm. initially and if there's a lot of strife. Sure. But then they also had the, the parenting uh, plan and... Uh, to have that in in place and i think it's so important mm-hmm. to have a written parenting plan in your divorce decree so whenever it's a strife you can just fall back into that this is the way we agreed or what absolutely do you think? i totally agree with you i think that the more detail you have in your co-parenting plan the better um and i think i mean we know people are not always going to follow the parenting plan, right? I mean, it says, you and I talked about this, it says we won't alienate the other parent, we won't say anything negative, but what's what's the reality that yeah. someone is actually not going to ever do that? But I do think it's important to have as much detail as you can in there. Um, my co-parenting plan with my ex-husband is ginormous. It's huge, so much detail. Um, And I keep it on my phone. So I just pull it up if ever there's a problem and I just screenshot it and send it over. And, you know, that usually settles the problem. But I think if you have a pretty generic parenting plan, that's a problem because there isn't enough detail. You can go back and forth, back and forth about pickup times and pickup places and dates, but it it just all has to be in there. Did you all ever have any co-parenting counseling together? We took... I think most states have that little like 30 minute or 60 minute online course that you have to do. So we did that. And then we also did a high conflict parenting class together. But I think, and that was like out of our own pocket, we paid for it. Um, And I believe it was an eight week course. We went every week for two hours. But I think that you know, in hindsight, I think that because we had just come out of the divorce, like we were actually, I think it was at temporary orders. They had said, all right, we want you to do this high conflict parenting class, but we didn't get anything out of it because we were too mad at each other. They really taught more about the adults emotions, which I think are important to know, but they, there wasn't a whole lot of focus on like, how can we 
how can we help the kids? How can we come together as a unit when we're not living together? So I think that that has to change. There are not good resources for people who are getting divorced when it comes to co-parenting. They want you to fly through that little class and that's not enough. What did you take one as well? Yeah, we took the online. In, in Texas, it's uh, you have to take the on, uh, online, or you have to take a co-parenting class. Now, if it's mm-hmm. online or not, that's that probably doesn't matter. But I, you know, it took a few hours to do it. But then, it, I think everything that's going to last, you actually have to repeat it, and you have to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's to just take a one-shot thing and think you're you're a good co-parent. That's just ridiculous. And uh, yeah. If, if well, you it's ever-changing, yeah. you know, the you, situation. If you have strife in a relationship, you really need to f- try to figure out a way to work towards. But then if both parents aren't willing to, to do it, it's very, very difficult. I think that's one of the hardest parts because what I experienced um, in the beginning was that I really wanted – my kids to still have, we're still a family, even though we're divorced, right? My kids are always going to look at their mom and their dad as their family. So I really wanted to kind of hold on to that, but it, you know, it gets more difficult the longer you've been divorced. Um, But I think that the kids, they need that. They need to know that you are still a family for them, not necessarily that you still love each other and you still whatever. But I think that it's important, especially when your kids are little for them to know that you're a united front, but that's so hard to do when there's all of this conflict and all of this extra emotion and things that are happening. So that's why I really think that you need some sort of collaborative effort to really get everything squared away, lined up. And I like your idea of having it be continuous yeah. Because everything, you know, your parenting relationship, your kids, your situation, everything changes. You're going to be a co-parent for X amount of years and things are not going to stay the same, you know, from year one to year six. So, yeah, I to- I think that's true. I think we need some sort of continuing education, continuing counseling, coaching. I think that would really help. Yeah. And you plan to set this up and work with this in the future, that's what I hope to do. I hope it will work. So that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think first, obviously, I'll have to finish my grad degree. Well, the way that I that I would like to do it is to set up a brick and mortar, you know, like a like a clinic, yeah. and then have counseling offered individually, couples co-parenting counseling, maybe coaching, and just make it kind of like a one-stop shop so that people can come in, they can get whatever they need from whatever resource they need it from, but we can all work together to to make that happen. So instead of, you know, Susie and Bobby can't get along, so they've got to go to this co-parenting class over here, and then the kids need play therapy, so they've got to go over here, but, you know, Susie got remarried to Jeff, and they need some help with their family dynamic. I think it would be nice if it was all in one place, and you could all work together, yeah. and kind of, I know it sounds sounds pretty lofty, but I think it could work. The majority, I think, of divorces actually can work together, but when it comes to the high conflict divorces where you have lost drive, you, you can't really kind of like work together. I think those are the ones that really need help. And I don't know exactly how to do that. How, how would you think, what, what is the best way to do that? I think my idea might be a little bit different than some. I think that I have learned that you can't change someone else. So sometimes you have to change your own behavior and it sucks sometimes that you have to do that. But, you know, if I can anticipate what my co-parent is going to do, then I have the ability to change my reaction and it doesn't feel fair all the time, but, but yeah, being, being proactive instead of reactive, I think is a really good way to look at it. And that's been most helpful to me, just knowing I'm not going to be able to change their behavior, but I can change mine. So, and of course, I was, I was at a Halloween party last night and I was 
talking to a, a young woman who had gotten remarried. She has a stepson and she said that her stepson's mom had slashed her tires and had done all of this crazy stuff to her. You know, and in situations like that, there's nothing she can do to change that mother's behavior. She's just going to have to change as much of hers as she can, her reaction to the behavior, and just kind of, you know, play the game, I guess, which stinks. But, boy, what a mess. Yeah. Yeah, that's sad that uh, adults behave like that. And uh, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of fear, a lot of uh, anger that you have to deal Definitely. with. Definitely. And uh, forgiveness. And I, that's the hardest part, you know, for, yeah. is is realizing that forgiving is not really for them. It's for you. Exactly. You know, and right. that can be really hard to digest for so some how, people. How many years, how long ago did you, what was your divorce finalized? So we have been divorced since uh, Valentine's Day of 2018. Okay. <laughs> uh, but we separated about a year before that. Yeah. So... And our kids were really little. They were one year old and three years old when we separated. So So how is it now? Has it changed uh, the dynamics uh, from the beginning until now? And uh, in what way? Definitely. I think that at the beginning, of course, we both really loathed each other and we didn't want to have anything to do with each other. I think that, you know, it ended kind of abruptly. So there wasn't a whole lot of time for either one of us to process exactly what had happened. But I feel like as you move through the co-parenting process, you learn a little bit more every day how you can help your kids. And that kind of translates to your co-parenting relationship. If you can just remember that you're doing it for the kids, it gets easier. So I've been really lucky that we have been able to kind of come over some of those hurdles really nicely and we we actually co-parent pretty well now we have an occasional moment but for the most part we do pretty well yeah so many of the people i've interviewed have been married quite a long time now you have you were married a little bit shorter time now Mm -hmm. did you have to deal with any depression loneliness or difficulties Um, after the divorce yourself I personally did not. I have really thrived after um, after getting divorced. I think that for me, I I knew that this was the right choice. I didn't have any doubt, and I. But I I went to therapy right okay. away. Awesome. You know, I started therapy right away, yeah. and I still am in therapy today. So, and you know, it's been three years. But yeah. I think that was really helpful for me to just have someone else to bounce it off of a neutral party. Yeah. So I really never struggled too much with that. But, but I think we were only married for five years. Yeah. So it wasn't, you know, we didn't devote our whole lives to each other. It was, it was a little bit different than people who've been married for 20 years. Yeah. We were married over, over 20 years. And uh, did mm-hmm. you, did you initiate the divorce or was it? I did. That? Yeah. Yeah. And I also mm-hmm. think it's a difference who initiates a divorce. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if you are not uh, initiating the divorce, I think for me, I went through a lot of loneliness for probably a year and a half. But I did one of mm-hmm. the best things was to sign up and, and get a counselor. Uh, and then yeah. I also got a coach and a mentor as well. And um, I can see this, for me, it definitely became a, a turning point in my life. Uh, mm-hmm. I had many things I needed to work on myself. And... Uh, by going through this, kind of like you, you're getting shaken up in a mm-hmm. way. And it's a wake-up call. It is a truly wake-up call, kind of like an awakening in a way. Yeah. And uh, I think anybody that's willing to do the work, to, to, do, mm-hmm. to do the work yourself, can turn your life into an amazing place. Uh, and uh, it just takes, takes courage. It takes, uh, takes some work on yourself. And then having somebody around you, have, that's what I think, having people around you. You shared about the, the village, uh, having people mm-hmm. around you that care and that you trust. I think it's one yep. of the most important things to have. Uh, I agree. 
I agree. And my, so my uh, ex-husband's family and I are still very close. My kids see them all the time. So I'm really fortunate to truly have that village that it takes to, to raise kids. And my kids are close to both sets of grandparents and I've been really fortunate and my kids are really lucky that way too. I know that's not how it works out for everyone. I wish it would, but I know that's not. Yeah. It takes it takes an effort, and it's uh, really interesting and fun to see that not a lot, of, not all marriages just go into a crash, and and then you're bitter enemies. But uh, you can actually mm-hmm. work together to for the kids' best. And I think to have the kids in focus is one of the most important things. And mm-hmm. it's so important for the kids when they grow up to have a good relationship with both parents. Um, because Absolutely. It's, so, it's so much alienation, etc., in uh, bitter divorces, and it's very mm-hmm. destructive for, especially for the kids, when that happened. Yeah, I think when you use your kids as weapons, or you use, you know, the other parent to try to turn your kids against them, it's like, for what? You know, the, yeah. they're little tiny people who just want to love both their mom and their dad or both parent, both parents. So I think the best thing you can do is just recognize that your kids need two loving adults in their lives. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. And uh, ha- having uh, uh, the, the kids in, in focus, having them as, uh, as uh, the main thing. But uh, now when there, is there a difference you think uh, when you have that young kids uh, initially in divorce because my kids they were older they're all they're both right now they're uh, my youngest is 16 but during the divorce she was 12 uh, my mm-hmm. oldest uh, was uh, uh, I think he was uh, 18 or 19 um, yeah I feel like because my kids were so little, I mean, my son, he doesn't even remember what it's like to have two parents who live together. Yeah. I remember going, picking him up from daycare and he was talking about a little friend and he said, oh, it must be his daddy's day because he's picking him up and his mom and dad are married. So, you know, that's been kind of a hard, hard thing for me, realizing that he hasn't had that experience of having two parents live together. Yeah. But I also think it kind of is a blessing that we did this when they were so little because they haven't become accustomed to mom and dad together for so long. And I, they really have adjusted very well now that they're three years older. So I can see, I think I can see, I hate to say a positive, but I can, I can see a positive to, to us divorcing when they were so little. Yeah. What do you think? Do you feel like your older kids are, I, I talked to another uh, Randy in another a previous uh, um, podcast, and he thought it can actually be more difficult for older kids to go through divorce. And uh, mm-hmm. he has three sons, and he only has a relationship with uh, one of them right now, uh, due to uh, he believes it, the, the divorce and uh, the problems going in the divorce. And he initiated the divorce. Right. For different reasons. But uh, he thinks it's more difficult a lot of times for adult kids to uh, figure these things out. From my experience, that seems like it could definitely be true. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, my kids are seemingly totally fine with it. I mean, of course, they've had some therapy and things like that, but but they really seem to have adjusted well. Yeah. And that's also something that uh, we did right in, initially in divorce is that we actually wrote in the divorce decree that uh, our kids would go through uh, counseling. So my youngest two went through counseling for a couple of years because that way they can talk about things with a third party that's not biased and share their right. whatever. And then we would also come in as parents uh, uh, now and then and visit and talk about the issues together with the counselor. And I thought that mm. was very beneficial I think, yeah, I think counseling is always beneficial in in my opinion or coaching or some sort of, of something where you can help to have a little bit of direction and especially for little kids or older kids when they just don't understand. I think having that neutral party is really good for them. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, are either you or, or your husband dating or have another relationship? So we both have dated. Um, he has dated a little bit more than I have. I really took my time. I, 
I think I was single for, gosh, at least three years before I really started. And we've only been divorced three and a half years. So it's really only been like the last six months, maybe, maybe a little longer that I've really felt like I was ready to date. I think that's a really important thing too, after you get divorced is to give yourself some time to learn who you are and figure out what you want. Um, because you know, you jump right back into it and then you're just repeating the same patterns over yeah. again. So for me, it was important to wait. Yeah, for me it was too. I, I jumped into dating too quickly right after the divorce, mainly because I was uh, lonely. But then mm -hmm. uh, I actually took uh, a two-year break from dating and uh, finding myself and being okay to be myself and uh, starting yeah. to learn more about myself. And I right. Think, yeah. And I think that can be difficult after you've been with someone for so long. It's difficult to remember what you need and who you are. Yeah. So those are all important things to know before you date. Yeah. Now to introduce that to the kids, have you guys talked to the kids about uh, uh, future relationships and how does that work? I have not introduced my kids to anyone or really let them know that I'm dating. Uh, my ex-husband has introduced the kids to a few girlfriends, I think. And um, the first one was hard. It was a really emotional experience for me, but that was a few years ago. So I've gotten a little bit better at meeting the girlfriends and, you know, I've just found it's, it's so important to be supportive of dad's relationship with, with his girlfriend, which sometimes is hard, yeah. but you know, when the kids come home and like I said, my kids are little when they come home and they tell me all these fun things that they did with dad's girlfriend and dad, it, sometimes it's a little bit hard to get excited about it. And, yeah. but I try and, you know, I think having that, uh, that putting in that effort is important because then the kids know that you support dad and the girlfriend and whatever. So, but it's hard. When that started with ex-husband having a, a date, etc., and talking to the kids when they come back, has it been uh, difficult in, in any way? I think it was it was difficult for, for me in the beginning and yeah. it was difficult for the kids too. Um, in what way? they had some questions about like, who is daddy's friend and, um, are they going to get married? I saw them yeah. kiss. What does that mean? So that, then that was hard for me too, yeah. it, you know, especially with the first girlfriend, just to, to realize that you're, you're not that person anymore for them. Yeah. And then, for the kids, I think it can be confusing. They don't know who this person is or what they're doing. And, you know, which is why I think it's always important to try to support the relationship as best you can. I know it's hard, but the kids are wondering what's happening. And if you can support a little bit and show like, it's okay, that's, that's dad's friend, whoever. I think it gives the kids a sense of peace and a sense of like, okay, every, everything's okay. This person is all right. And, you know, anything that you have to say negative, probably don't say it in front of the kids yeah. <laughs> or to your ex, you know, say it to your mom or your best friend, yeah. but that, but that's hard. You know, it's really hard. Yeah. I think it's important not to speak negative about each other's former husband or wife. And, um, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's important to have a friend that, uh, a close friend that you can talk to about these things because they're difficult things that you have to work through. And if you try to work it through in your own head, sometimes it just becomes uh, a big, uh, difficult mess. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard when the only perspective you have is your own, right? Yeah, exactly. Because then you're just, you're talking to yourself all day and there's no one else to give you another opinion. So I totally agree. I think if you have a best friend or you have, you know, a group of, of friends that you, I know you play tennis, you go and play with some of your tennis friends and you can blow off steam that way. But, yeah. but I think keeping your negative opinions to yourself is so important for the health of your kids and the health of your co-parenting relationship. And, you know, you can hate your ex, just don't say it to the kids or your ex. Right. Yeah. And, uh, for, for me, it was definitely good to be able to talk to someone. It was actually my counselor said, start talking to, to one or a few friends that you trust. And just mm -hmm. by hearing myself saying things, I realized, wow, maybe it's not that way. It's like you, you're just hearing yourself talk. 
and then you mm-hmm. realize, okay, maybe it wasn't like this. My perspective might be a little bit uh, not the way it actually is. And then uh, by right. hearing somebody uh, commenting and and seeing their pers- perspective on it, it makes mm-hmm. uh, it makes it a lot easier. I think. I agree, and I think your experience with your your ex is always going to color what what you think is happening how you feel and what you see happening is going to look different to you based off of your experiences with your ex so having an outside source to say you know Katie I don't really think that's what your ex was doing I think from my perspective it looks like x y and z happened and you're like oh yeah I get yeah I can see that maybe I'm overreacting or whatever it's so nice to have that extra opinion to kind of let you get not be so inside of your head yeah, and I also think it's important to have friends that can actually speak truth and not just agree yes. with you. And, Absolutely. Um, for example, I have uh, my best friend. We, we both went through divorce at the sa- about the same time. And uh, he was he had a, a lot more friction than I had in my uh, divorce. And he was so negative. And uh, we were actually roommates. <laughs> oh boy <laughs> i got to hear this on a regular basis and, oh uh, man but i i would not let him get get you know i would just point it out and it's like i uh, you know he thanked me later it's like it, it yeah. was definitely uh some wild discussions we had <laughs> it can be it can be hard to hear when you're you know it can be hard to hear the truth about about what you're doing and what you're saying and how you're feeling but it is important to have a friend yeah. who will do that for you yeah. and he did the Absolutely. same thing to me so we were like in a way very very good for each other because we mm-hmm. we did not just sugarcoat things and say you know i agree with everything you say etc yeah she's terrible etc but actually yeah. confront it and uh, working through yeah. it. Yeah, and that's the hardest part, right? You have to grow through what you go through, as they say. You have to really try and work on yourself and learn about yourself. And, you know, it's all a learning experience. You just have to be willing to learn it and work on it. Yeah, exactly. So, so we're going to round this podcast off here, and I just want to ask you a question. You're going to be in a, a counselor and a psych are you gonna be uh, like a psychologist or Uh, just a licensed family a marriage and family therapist licensed uh, family therapist and uh, Mm -hmm. you want to work with parents and you want to work with uh, in co-parenting and etc now if you have uh, a couple that are struggling right now uh, with co-parenting and they can't uh, agree and it's a fairly recent divorce uh, what would your suggestions be to to them if they're listening right now i think i would probably suggest that they each go to therapy first and foremost so that they have a neutral party to bounce ideas off of to let off steam to really kind of figure out what they want what they need um, because that will help your co-parenting relationship if you can both relieve some of the stress relieve some of that time high emotion. I think that makes it a lot easier. Of course, if you can go to therapy together, I think that would be awesome. But let's be real, not many people are probably going to want to do that, right? Um, And I think just like we talked about having someone you can talk to so that you're not being so combative with your co-parent because the kids don't need to see that. So I, I really think therapy is the way to go. That's my biggest recommendation, therapy all the way. Yeah, I, I really think that's a great way, especially in the beginning. But uh, like I've had the same counselor for the last five years, but the last few years, I just call her when it's necessary, where I feel mm-hmm. okay, this is an issue. Uh, but for the first few years, I went on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, I, I think that's very, very good advice uh, to focus on you, trying to, mm-hmm. to figure out you and then. Right. To, to get the co-parenting to work and and also maybe look through your, what do you usually say like uh, having your not not being too perfectionistic but trying to work things through and and uh, look at the bright side of life absolutely positive outlook you have to you know you have to have a positive outlook in order to feel good about things yeah so yeah 
That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for hanging out over on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was so much fun. Yeah, and uh, you that are listening, I, I know that there, there can be a lot of strife in relationships when they break up. But um, for me, it was definitely a wake-up call. My life has turned out it's definitely not perfect. It never will be. Perfection doesn't exist. But uh, I know that my relationship or my my life right now it turned into a beautiful place and uh, it can for for anybody that wants to it can be very dark uh, in this this place if it's just going through a divorce but it doesn't have to stay that way and by taking action by by finding somebody that you trust a friend a counselor and i think for men it might be a little bit more difficult to reach out uh, to a friend and share that was difficult for me. I, I had a hard time being vulnerable and uh, being open. Sure. But um, it was mm-hmm. actually one of the best things that happened in the divorce is that I had to start becoming open with people and starting sharing. You know, I was so much so ashamed about having to go through divorce. But mm-hmm. um, by me having to, to take that step, I grew tremendously myself. And there's nothing better to be able to be you instead of trying to pretend to be somebody else. Uh, right. Trying to be perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which will never happen, so. <laughs> no, but uh, it's like, uh, no, it's it's a learning experience. and uh, Definitely. But it's easy to get stuck in this in this dark place uh, mm-hmm. if, you, if you go through depression, loneliness, and then you can't stay there. You have to reach out to somebody to help you. It's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to do yourself. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, I just uh, really think that uh, if you're in that place, really reach out to a friend and, and a counselor and get that help you need because you can get to this beautiful place uh, and just take one day at a time. So thank you again, Katie, for this awesome time. Yeah, thank you so much. We had a good time. 